So we'll move up to. Oh wait. Generatives. Here we go. All right. So I'm gonna. I, I think we might be able to wrap up today. Wrap this class up because it seems like everybody last week was getting the hang of it. So I'm gonna run through a few more of these. We left off with content. It was the last one we did last time, right? We covered content, generative of content. Or did we? Yes. Did we? Okay. I, I needed a microphone because I was yelling at the computer <laughs> what genitive it was. Oh. <laughs> <I just shut. laughs> it's a good thing I wasn't here because I was wrong. <laughs> oh. <laughs> you should be careful for uh, forcefulness. <laughs> all right. So um, see if we can see where this comes on here. So we'll pick up with uh, number 17 and the one that the handout that I emailed, the second one I emailed out today, which is subordination, which is an interesting, uh, it's not super common. I was thinking of skipping it, but I think it's just kind of an interesting one. Uh, subordination specifies that which is subordinated to or under the dominion of the word modified. So that the genitive is under the modified word. You can put of or over in place of of. In place of the word of, you can put over. So Matthew 9, 34, uh, by the ruler of demons, he's driving out demons. Ruler of demons, demons is the genitive, and ruler is over the demons. King over Israel. God over this world. Um, and so that's fairly straightforward, but it's kind of an inter interesting genitive. Next, association. The associative genitive identifies the party with whom the noun modified is in company. So Ephesians 5, 7, do not become partakers of them. And you could put with or in association with in place of the word of. Don't become partakers in association with them or with them. I am a fellow servant with you and your brethren. Romans 8, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. You are fellow citizens with the saints, or in association with the saints. Uh, we would not have been partners with them. Um, now, this next one is uh, is a is you would instead of trying to figure out the genitive, you would look up the preposition because it comes after a preposition meta, translated with. He was with the wild animals. Uh, so, all right. Next one means. The genitive specifies the impersonal means, the instrument, the thing, the power, the tool that's being used by which something is accomplished. Uh, usually the action is expressed by a passive verb or a verbal adjective. So this one, it's, all the examples I have follow prepositions. So I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this because, like I said before, uh, and ones that follow a preposition, it's better to look up the preposition and pick which meaning of the preposition is best instead of messing around with figuring out the genitive. But just so you're aware there's such a thing as a genitive of means, the waves were battering the boat. They're the tool that was battering the boat in Matthew 16. His blood is the tool that brings redemption. The lusts are the tool by which one is tempted, so on. All right, agent. The genitive of agent specifies the personal means. So it's just like the last one, except it's a person. The tool is a person. So if the tool is a thing, it's means. If the tool is a person, then it's agent. It should be taught. The tool teaching you is God. God is the one teaching you. So uh, that's agent. High, known by the high priest. Uh, loved by God. And then you see these following a preposition as well. Uh, so, all right, next one, cause, also a little bit similar to those last two, um, but this is more indicating reason or or cause. Um, all of, Again, all these are connected to prepositions, usually appa or ek, and so I'm not going to spend a lot of time with them because it's better to study the preposition, but you get the idea, um, like that John... All right, uh, say Matthew 14, 26, a third example here. They cried out from fear because of fear. It was their fear that was the cause of them crying out. Um, so, 
so the so this is a little bit different than means. Do you see the difference between this and means? Like when they cried out from fear, it's not that fear was the tool they used to cry out, but it was the cause, it was the reason. Does that make sense? Slightly different. Okay. Uh, time. This is uh, one that's usually really obvious. I wasn't going to even do it, except that we had an example in our practice, so I threw it in there. Uh, it's just when, when, when the thing happens. So this one came to him of night is literally, if you just translate it like a genitive in John 3, 2. This one came to him of night, at night. That's the time. Uh, neither winter nor of the Sabbath. That is a uh, question. Is it it's, you're saying time, but it, would that be the chronos, or would that be the, uh, would that actually be just the time frame, the area? Of the news? Or are we focused upon just straight up logistical time, or? Yeah, just just the, the when it happened, as opposed to some other time. So, so yeah, the, this one came to him night at the Sabbath. Um, this Luke three two is kind of an interesting one. During, and that's uh, actually the preposition epi, upon, isn't how you'd normally translate epi. Upon the priesthood of Annas and Caiaphas, God's word came to John. Uh, and it, they translate it during because they're taking it as a genitive of time. At that period of time. I mentioned you might, in my prayers, day and night time. Okay. Direct object. Every once in a while, a genitive is a direct object. Usually a direct object would not be in the genitive case. Usually a direct object would be in the accusative case. Um, now, just a quick review. This class is only about genitive, the genitive case, but there's, some, there's other cases like nominative is the subject of the sentence, accusative is the object of the sentence. Um, but every once in a while, certain verbs take a genitive as their object instead of an accusative. It's just a quirky thing in Greek. So stop touching me. Uh, you would think that would be accusative, but it's not. It's genitive. So every once in a while you get that, just with certain verbs that tend to that way. Uh, 24, and that's not anything you'd ever need to identify or would help you interpret a sentence or anything. It's going to be obvious to you, just so you know when you see a genitive and it looks like it's a direct object and you don't freak out. You can just say, oh, yeah, that's possible. All right, 24, absolute. This one is basically, so the last one is a, a genitive when it should be accusative. Absolute is genitive when it should be uh, nominative. It's the subject. So it's working like a subject, but it's genitive case. So that Matthew 2, 1, Jesus, having been born in Bethlehem, wise men came from the east. Uh, it's uh, functioning as a subject of that clause there. But it's a genitive case, so we call it a genitive of absolute, or an absolute genitive. The promise of entering his rest remaining, some of you still seem to have fallen short of it. See that? Okay. And that last one is really tricky because there's the, the word that is um, the absolute is actually omitted. Uh, having comes, well, I won't get into that, but... Sometimes it's just implied. All right. Number 25, relationship. This is uh, where the word modified is some family or social relationship, but the, relation, the relational word is missing from the sentence. So in Acts 13.22, I, literally, I have found David the, of Jesse. The word son is not in the Greek. So in the Greek, it just says, I have found David the... Of Jesse, the of Jesse one. And that means it's implied the relationship of Je the son of Jesse. So uh, now if, it, if the word son is present, then we wouldn't call it a genitive of relationship. We'd call it a genitive of what? The son of Jesse. Possessive. Possessive, yeah. Possessive genitive. Jesse's son. So if they have the word there, we just call it possessive, but if the word's missing, then we call it a relationship. Is there a Greek word or the? Greek word for what? The? the? Yeah. Oh, yeah. 
Because this would make sense without it too. I thought they put. I thought the was one of those words. That, is it a then? One of those words that there isn't a Greek word for, but they just put it. Oh no! The the um there is definitely a Greek word for the that happens all the time. So what? What, you, what was this? This is uh, uh, Acts thirteen twenty two. So. So I have found David son of. Let me see if I. Here's David, the, here's the word the, and then there's the word the again, Jesse. So David, the, the, of the Jesse. So David, the, of the Jesse. That's how it, so the word the is twice in a row. Because it's, it's implied David, the son of the Jesse. A lot of times they put the in front of a, a, a um, proper noun just because it's a proper noun. The, the Jesse. Sound all right, too. David of Jesse. David of Jesse. Um, yeah, you could say it that. I mean, that's just kind of a uh, kind of an old, older English way of saying this. Sometimes they translate the words the and sometimes they don't, but. So that's exactly what this is. Yeah. The of Jesse is not an English way of saying things. That's kind of a Greek way of saying things, and it's a gen genitive of relationship. So, yeah. So you already knew about the genitive of relationship. You just didn't know what it was called. Yeah. Okay. All right. We're done with the lecture. Um, now let's just practice, 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 and we'll see if we can get these. And then we've got a hard one at the end, and when we're once we're done with the class. Well, I thought the first one was kind of hard because I saw, found myself being able to apply several different types of genitives. To this is Romans eight thirty three. The eight thirty three. Yes. Okay, so who will bring any charge against the chosen of God? What what did you get in your list? Did you? Well, you know. If I have to plant my flag on one, I would say possessive. Okay. Because it's not just any. Person's chosen. It's God's chosen. All right, possession. God's chosen. Yes. It could be, I thought it could be reference. It's not just any chosen, but it's chosen of God. Okay. All right, so reference. If you have somewhat of a reformed perspective on things, uh, you could also say source, I would think, because you can't be chosen. That status of chosen comes from God. Okay, so... So source, source, let's talk. Uh, yeah, right, right. So, so th I would what the way you just described it, I would say agent rather than uh, source because source would mean the people themselves are coming from God, not the choice, but the people, the chosen. The chosen refers to the people. Okay. And so they would be coming, the people themselves would be coming from God. But if you're saying the choice comes from God, God chooses. Then we would call that agent. He's the agent doing the choosing. Okay. That makes sense. Yeah. So I still got three options. So you still got those. Options. Anybody can see anything else, or have an opinion about what, which of those three? <laughs> Did we have production in that three? No. So production uh, produce, produces produce. chosen people. Yeah, that would, again, that would. I think that would work. I, if if we went that way instead of product, production, because I don't think of the chosen so much as a product, uh, as much as um, the object of that action of choosing. So if God is doing the choosing and the chosen are the ones getting chosen, then what would we call that? It's implying a, an, an action, right? The word, the noun chosen implies the action of choosing. And so when, when you have an implied action, then you're into that realm of the subject and object of genitives, right? So which one would this be if we take it as one of those? The genitive is objective? It's the object or subjective? Okay, subjective. So God is the subject doing the choosing. And the chosen are getting chosen. Right. Yeah. Right on. Well, okay, so I think I still have to get out of this kicking mindset that when I go to the Greek, it's going to answer, answer every question. Because it's so exact. 
Here's an example of, you know, can vary. And depending on what commentary you're reading, if you have uh, one person who leans toward a major camp of theology, they're yeah. going to take this and say, well, it means this. Yeah. And when you look at it, it could. Although, oh, that's true. That's true. Although, there have been times when my theology lines up with a certain use of the genitive perfectly. But I look at it and I think, I don't think that's what it is. It's It just doesn't have the feel of that kind of genitive. It has more of the feel of this kind of genitive. And you get that over time doing this. So it's a, it's a little bit more exact than just saying, well, we just identified four possibilities, so from there we just have to throw up our hands. You can get it more exact. And the better people are at Greek, the more they get the real good scholars who really, really understand this stuff, or the people back then who spoke this stuff, they would know right away. Out of those four that you just said, they would take three of them and say, no, it's not those, it's this. So uh, you, you, can, you can hone in. So let's talk about it a little bit. Who can bring any charge against the chosen of God? So we've got possession, God's chosen. If we say it's that one, then what we're saying is what Paul's really trying to get across here is the possessiveness of it. They belong to God. They, they're his. Um, now, obviously, it's implied that he did some choosing in, if they're chosen, they're chosen by God, and that's implied, but that's not the emphasis. The emphasis would be they're his. They belong to him. Or is it more likely, does it seem more like the emphasis is um, they receive this action of choosing. They got chosen by him. Who's going to bring a charge of the people who got chosen, who received this election? Who's going to ever charge them with something? Is that the emphasis? Or um, agent. An agent and, and uh, uh, subject of genitive here are pretty much the exact same meaning, so I don't see a difference between those two. But So let's just go between those two. Uh, say agent, since that's a little bit more specific, or possessive. Uh, if, if For me, if I have to land on one, I would say the same thing you said if you had to land on one. I'd say possessive, because it seems to me that's more... Who would dare come and bring an accusation against someone who belongs to God? You know, that seems to be more the emphasis than uh, the fact that they they were elected by God. Even though both ideas are present in both cases, I see I see this a slight more likelihood that the emphasis is belonging to God. That makes sense to everybody. Okay, definitely a judgment call. Would 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 that just be? A supporting communism versus a true Arminianism, as far as like if you decide to choose that way. Or no, no, and no, because uh, either Calvinism, or Arminianism. Did you really choose it? <laughs> <laughs> um, either way, the verse is saying that that the people got chosen by God. On what basis? The Calvinist and Arminianist debate uh, are on what basis did they get chosen? So Arminians would say they got chosen on the basis of something in them. Our Calvinists would emphasize, no, they got chosen on what had nothing to do with them, only on the on, only on the basis of what was in God's heart. And that's where that debate, and this this identification of the genitive wouldn't enter into that discussion at all. Because yeah, that's what I thought. Okay. Those arguments were as yeah. Great, great job. And 10 extra credit points for Josiah for coming up with uh, the genitive that we just covered today. <laughs> Hey, now who's the teacher's That's excellent. <laughs> yeah. You know what's going to come around. To All right. <laughs> First Corinthians 2.13. This is what we speak, not in words taught of human wisdom, but in words taught of the spirit. So of human wisdom first. Let's, what's that one? I would say means. Means, okay. So the tool, the human wisdom is the tool used to teach these words? Yes. Okay. All right. Anything else? I think agent would work in. Agent? Yeah, taught by humanism. Yeah. Okay. Except agent is agent is a personal um, thing. Human wisdom is. More of a concept, not a person. So if you're going to go with agent, it would be better um, means. Yeah, 
But there is one other one. Cause. Cause. Um, the genitive is the reason. Cause. Human wisdom caused the teaching to happen. I don't know. I don't think I would. I don't think I would land on cause. Okay. Well, what was the one that we've already said? Or uh, uh, agent, or, or not uh, means means. By the, you're saying by what humans? Is it content? No, I don't think it would be content. And let's put it, is it comparison? Um, because you could replace the of with human words. Um, the words. So content would be like a glass of water, words taught of human wisdom. Um, so like the words, words are filled up with human wisdom. Oh, if it's modifying a verb in place of the word of, oh, okay. I, 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 I got confused. Okay, yeah. How about, uh, what I got on that one was source. I know we're thinking we're going all the way back. That's number six in our list, but. It seems to me source a little bit more than ca or uh, a, uh, means, sorry, um, because I it's both are possible. But means is human wisdom is a tool used by someone to teach these words. Um, to, to me, it seems like human wisdom is the source from which we're getting this these words. Um, very very close in meaning. Either one is fine. I just uh, I just kind of landed on source a little more. Would that would that make an impact upon uh, defining that as far as if you want to deliver a sermon and do it on that? Particular no, if I were preaching this, I don't think it'd be. If I decided ah, it's more source, no, it's more means. When it came out in my sermon, I don't think there'd be any difference in the way I preach the sermon. So I assume you got the same for. Thought of the spirit too. Diverse. Actually, before I answer that, let me just let me just make one more comment about what I just said. Because you might think, well, if it doesn't matter in the sermon, why would it? Why even do it? Same reason. Oh, I don't have my glasses. Same reason I sometimes wear my glasses. When I um, right now, I can look. My glasses are for seeing far. Um, when I, the farther I look, the blurrier it gets. When I look across the room, I can make out. Pretty much everything that's over, they make that bookcase and that there are books and traces and me in the picture and stuff. Um, pretty much, I pretty much got it. I could pretty much tell you what's there. If I put on my glasses, it's so much sharper. And I can just make it out a lot better. And um, I have a better concept in my mind of exactly what's over there. And usually it doesn't matter in, in the case of just looking across the room. In reading road signs while I'm driving, it matters a lot. It's the difference between there's a sign up there or <laughs> it actually says something. Um, but but with uh, with studying Greek, if you do this, sometimes you won't see any big earth-shattering differences in interpretation. But you looked at it with clarity. You got a little sharper understanding, and then you back up, look at the more the forest, and do your interpretation. And it's just a little, just that much more accurate. Your little bits of pieces of your thinking. Okay. All right. So. Uh, Words of human wisdom, words taught of the spirit. Now, that was my first impulse, too, is to think, well, they got to be the same. They're parallel here, of the wisdom of the spirit. But there is a difference. What's the difference between of human wisdom and of the spirit? Personal. Yeah, of the spirit is personal. So that's what I actually landed on agent there. Source and then agent, or means and then agent. Unless you're bad theology, you don't think the spirit is a person. <laughs> But would you have gone more with source again, like you did on the first one? Um, it could be, yeah. If I go with source on the first one, words taught. No, I wouldn't. I don't know. I don't think I would. I don't think the emphasis is that they're coming from him as much as he's doing it. I think I would put agent. Source first. Agent. Paul can shift slightly, in, even in a parallel Two parallel ideas. He can still shift slightly in meaning. Okay. Uh, but, you know, that's a judgment call. It's definitely not dogmatic on it. Okay. Any questions on that one? Colossians 2.11. In him. Oh, wait a minute. Did we ever go? Actually, 
Yeah, we're going. Okay. All right. In him you were also circumcised with the circumcision of Christ. Of Christ, modifying circumcision. Production. Production. He produces the circumcision. Christ produces the circumcision. Okay, anything else? Content. Content? The circumcision filled up with Christ? I don't think so. I wasn't here for that one, so. Yeah, content is like, yeah, just think, <laughs> just think glass of water. Glass of water is a genitive of content. Okay. Uh, the, the word modified is filled up with the water. Okay. So. Oh, could it be subjective? Subjective. So, so Christ is the subject uh, doing the circumcising. Yeah. Of the circumcision. Um. Done by Christ. Would be translated with the circumcision done by Christ. Yeah, could be that. Then that means agent. Then what yeah, the, yeah. Agent, agent would be just a little more specific way of saying that same thing. So I would put, if I took it that, I would, I'd take agent. That's what I got. I got agent. Christ is the agent doing the circumcising. Yeah. Okay. Source. Source. Which circumcision. Production that comes from Christ. Yeah, could be source. Could be source. Um, it's actually a very, very difficult verse. I, there's some more genitives in that verse, and I, I was a little bit rushed putting this together, and I was like, okay, this is a little more. I would need more time <laughs> to figure this whole verse. That's a, that's a hard verse. That's why there's the ellipsis in the middle. Dot, dot, dot. <laughs> that's all the hard stuff. It's just an extremely difficult verse, but uh, yeah. So yeah, I think it could be source. Um, depending on how you think of the concept of circumcision, because it's liter it's not literal circumcision, so yeah, okay. Um, probably you would study this passage and you'd come up with a real solid concept of what circumcision of the heart really means, and then you'd identify the genitive at that point. So it might be easier to decide between source and agent. And again, the, the, the emphasis, what's the difference in emphasis? If, we, if somebody says, I think this is agent, and somebody else says, no, I think it's source, what's the difference between those two? What's the subtle variation in emphasis? Okay, so if it's, if it's agent, what am I emphasizing? That is personal, right? That Christ is doing it. Yes. I really want to. I want, really want you to get the fact that Christ is doing this. Um, if it's source, what am I emphasizing more? That it just originates. Yeah, it's originating wow. from Christ. This is where it came from. So, so those are a little bit different. And then, and as you say the verse, you can decide kind of which which of those it is. Trying to, on agent, the last sentence you have on that is usually the action is expressed through a passive verb or verbal adjective. And I haven't been taking those into consideration. I don't know where, what that would be in that verse with the circumcision. The circumcision is the... Right. So let's see, let's, uh, let's go to agent. agent or uh, the generative specifies a personal, this is number 20, personal means an intelligent being by which something is done. Usually the action is expressed through a passive verb or a verbal adjective. So uh, uh, John 6.45, all shall be taught of God, and you would express it by saying by God, uh, taught by. Taught by is a passive verb. Okay. Um, Known of the high priest, loved of God. So you, the way you're translating it comes out as a passive verb. Uh, circumcised by Christ. But then you got with the circumcised by Christ, it doesn't flow then at that point. I guess is where I was going with it. I see. With the circumcision by Christ. 
But you would change yeah. that circumcision to yeah, the circumcised by with the uh, yeah. You're right. It doesn't really yeah. So there's a good example where looking at the examples helps you identify it. So having done that, I would say I would just call let's land on agent here because source doesn't require the action, whereas agent agent needs an yeah action. yeah. So agent genitives of agent come tend to come out as those. Passive verbs. Like when we were talking about Romans 833, mm -hmm. chosen of God. Right. We could see, we said that that could be a source. Yeah. But the possessive was probably better. Right. But, but chosen by, yeah, that would work better with those action. examples. Yep. Yeah. Exactly. So what are we going with on that one? Now? I would put agent on that one. Yeah. See, I thought you were asking. Yeah, it, it, I thought agent, agent was the one that didn't sound right now because it would be with the circumcised of or by Christ, or by Christ which doesn't sound too. Oh, that's the one that's that's. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I thought we were talking. About, okay, so source then. Yeah. Okay. Just making sure. Okay, source. Yeah. Circumcision. Wait, what? <laughs> so everything we were just saying about the verbal, the the passive verb, that that wasn't source. That's agent. Yeah. Yes. Okay. That's yeah. That's agent. So agent is the one that comes out like a verb. Right. Um, it, it wants an action. It wants to modify more of an action. Right. So source is what what this one. But so like, like Christ, circumcision, we would consider that more in line with an action, right? Except that it's talking about a thing, a, the circumcision. Um, or a completed event, as opposed to the process. Yeah. Right. Or, it's talking about or, two separate ones. Actually, like we have obviously the, the the circumcision without hands is a whole separate ordeal. Yeah. So, 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 so. Yeah, you were circumcised with the circumcision. You were circumcised with something, and what what were you circumcised with? This thing of Christ, this circumcision of Christ circumcision that Christ. comes from Christ. Yeah, I think I think source. Yeah, I source, think it's source. source yeah. Yeah, that's a tricky one. First Corinthians one twelve. Now I mean this that each of you is saying, I am of Paul, I am of Apollos, I am of Cephas, I am of Christ. I didn't put lines after each one, but they're all genitives. Partitive. So uh, explain. Um Because part, because normally you think part of I am one piece of Paul. Paul's the big, Paul's the big pie, and I'm one slice of it. Yeah, like he's got followers. There's more than one follower. Right. And he's saying, right. I'm. Yeah, that's that's an astute observation. Uh, very good. Because the, the Paul is a figure of speech. There, it's talking about. It's not talking about Paul. It's talking about Paul, the party, right? The party of Paul. The group. The, the Paul followers, you know, and I'm one of those one in that big group. So if you take it super literally, I am of Paul would make sense because I mean I'm I'm like his arm or his leg or so, you know that would if it's, if you're going to say par partitive, I'm not one part of Paul. But but if you understand that as a figure of speech meaning a party, then it would a group, a faction. I'm part of that faction. Then it would be partitive. Yeah. Association. That's what I got, was association. Uh, I am of associated with the Paul group. And so it's still taken into consideration figure speech, but it seems to me uh, more, uh, more emphasizing the association part than it is the I'm one piece of the whole part. That makes sense? So the identifies the party with whom the noun modified is incomplete. Right. So I'm the noun modified, yeah. and of uh, Paul is the party that I'm associated with. So and that, that would make sense because then you can replace the of with with. Yep. with I am with, I am with the Paul Apollos group. Right. If you're going to interpret the figure of speech, I'm with the Paul group. I'm with the Apollos group. Okay. I'm with the Cephas group. I assume you could, couldn't still go source also on that. I'm from Paul. I'm from Paul. <clears throat> I don't know. I don't think I wouldn't. I don't know if I'd get source on that one. Um, okay. Yeah. I think it's just, I think. Although in the context, Paul's dealing with foundations. Yeah. So from a theological perspective, you could almost say you're talking about origination. 
Yeah, origination because they're saying they're not necessarily saying Paul, Paulus, and Cephas and Christ are in their church, uh, but I was built upon. I was built on Paul. Paul. I was built on Peter. Oh, but yeah. when, when that when that would go to Adrian then? Um, it's well, I couldn't find the. No, it's not that. The, it's not that those four were were um, building these groups. It's just that these groups built themselves upon those okay. foundations. Right. Yeah, I think so. That's good. That's good. I think it could be source. You look at it that way. <laughs> well, that's better. <laughs> that's good. All right. <laughs> and it's hard. It's hard to do if you think of Paul as a. Concept as opposed to an individual. If you see if you see the Paul group as an existing group in the church right now, and I'm part of that, then it's part of it, or association, part of our association. If you see Paul as a guy kind of that started something, and I'm built on his his foundation, then it would be source. So you you see how just just trying to decide between those and just thinking through these has made us look at this verse from a couple of different angles, and it's it's helpful. Okay. And if you go further in First Corinthians when he talks about, you know, what's the difference between us? We all teach the same thing. It's like, why are you confused? There's yeah. nothing different here. Right, right. It's the same foundation. Yeah. It's four, four identical foundations. So what's the why? Why the division? Right. Okay, Mark one one. Oh. So with association, we replace the of, and we replace it with source. You replace it from. You put from. Uh huh. Uh, partitive, you still keep of, of or a conti- a con- uh, consisting of. But I can see where from and with could, I mean, depending upon the translator, there, that's going to lend you to mm-hmm. different kind of. Yep. Even though we were like, oh, it's splitting hairs between source and um, partitive, yeah. when you actually write it out as the translators would, it could take you down that path. That's why. Um, Greek, that's a great example of why it's good to have a little bit of exposure to Greek. Because what Andrew just said there, the translators say with or of, and at first glance it doesn't seem that different. And then when you look at the Greek, um, you know, you find out it could go down to fairly, pretty significantly different um, lines. And so what I want to do at that point is I want to take a glance at the Greek and see, is this just a genitive or is, this, is there a preposition here? Because prepositions will be more specific, and that'll that'll help me. Because maybe the preposition doesn't mean uh, it can't mean built on the foundation. It has to mean a part of a group or something like that. And so, so that's where, um, yeah, that's where it's good to just be able to just glance at the Greek and get the kind of a feel of yeah, it could be these two or no, it can't be that one. English translations can throw you off, um, especially with prepositions, because. You don't realize how many different nuances prepositions have in English, just like in Greek. Now, in Greek, we've got it all formalized and listed out, all these mm-hmm. genitives. In English, we have just as many different uses of the genitive, but we don't name them. We just have a feel for them because we speak English. Uh, and, and we just don't speak Greek as much, so we have to go through the formal way of doing it instead of just having an ear for it. But the more you do this, the more you get an ear for it. So it would be... And it would be better to know the Greek than to look at all the different comment or look at all the different commentaries or all the different um, translations and say, oh, so the translations, like more translations, view it as a gender of this. Well, it, all of it. I think it's all important. I think looking at the translate, those translators. I mean, they know all this stuff. They know, and a lot of those translators that are on those boards, they know a lot of those guys know Greek like we know English almost. They just have a feel. You know, and so I put a lot of stock in this, the Greek scholars, um, uh, and uh, and the translators. Um, but sometimes it's impossible. You use an gr- English word that fits perfectly with the Greek idea you have in mind, but when you use that English word, if someone's looking at that English word from another angle, it can mean a whole different thing, right? So it's not an inaccurate translation, but it's. The, 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 the English word has this semantic range, and the Greek word has this semantic range. And if you're over here, to interpreting it over here, outside of the Greek semantic range, you're missing it. You know, so, all right. For everyone on, online, I was just uh, doing circles with my hands. <laughs> Do you have uh, uh, 
you said Greek scholars. Do you have particular ones that you really like, or? Um, Offhand, if you don't. Yeah, them, I just uh, I like Lenski. Uh, he has a lot of he, he makes a lot of comments about uses of Greek words and grammar. Um, L e n s k y. Yeah. Okay. Lutheran commentator. Every time I think of my mind, I just think Lenski the Lutheran. I don't know why. But, um, and then uh, there's another commentary set that's a r real old set, uh, Meyer. It's edited by Meyer, M-E-Y-E-R. And um, Hills, he's one of the few commentators that'll say, oh, this is a this is a genitive of relationship or a genitive of this or genitive of that. Um, difficult reading, but. Goddard references Meyer. And Weiss a lot. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Meyer is really, um, and uh, in that Meyer set, there's different authors for different books of the Bible. So I don't even know what their names are, but I just use that set. So, um, and I have a, a, access to a lot. So if you're ever studying this stuff and you have a question on gender, just don't hesitate to shoot me an email or call or something. I love this stuff. You know, I got to tell you, just as an aside, how much I enjoy this. I, um, I was telling Tracy today. I've, I learned this uh, thirty years ago. I've been doing this for thirty years. I've never in thirty years had anybody I could talk to about genitives, <laughs> ever. <laughs> I, and now I do finally. So it was worth doing this class just, just so I wouldn't be so isolated in my life. Um, it was great. We were in Bible study the night. Josiah just leaned over to me and he says, "Is that a genitive?" You know, turned out it was a dative, but still, it's cool. <laughs> it's cool to just have somebody ask the question. You know, and just be thinking about that. So, all right. Um, Mark one one. These ones are tricky. Uh, these are the ones that I've been kind of, kind of what got me started deciding to do this class when I was working on this when we started Mark, the beginning of the Gospel of Jesus Christ. What is of Jesus? The gospel of Jesus Christ. I'm going to go out on Lynn M. Guess plenary. Plenary. Yeah. So it's both objective and subjective. It can be. It's, uh, it's, it's gospel um, preached by Christ yes. and the gospel about Christ. Yes. God, Christ, Christ is the gospel that's preached. And Mark meant to imply both of those. Yeah. I think there's an apple coming. <laughs> <laughs> Josiah, why can't I, when I go on Facebook right now, why can't I see what's what we're doing here? Shouldn't it be showing somewhere? Um, it might not. No. It would have to be at the top. Well, then I, is can, it? I can view it right now. Oh, you can view it? Okay, just so it's working. All right. Um, all right, so plenary. Uh, very interesting. I, I think, um, judging by the fact that like 50% of the commentators take it more objective and the other 50% more subjective, I think plenary might be <laughs> a good, good. And not just that though, but remember the author has to intend it. And if you go in this book further, um, so is Jesus Christ preaching it or is he the object of it more? Look at verse 14. Look at the very next one. After John was put in prison, Jesus went into Galilee proclaiming the gospel of God. That's the next time he refers to the gospel of God, or the gospel is of God. Um, so we get good news of, of Yeshua and then good news of God. Right. So it, um, that would kind of lend itself to it being a gospel that Jesus preached, a message right. from God that Jesus preached. But the whole book, what is the whole book of Mark? It's the good news about Jesus, right? So, and he says, and this is a title for the book, The Beginning of the Gospel of Jesus Christ. So I have a hard time saying it's not plenary. This is, I think, the, <laughs> the best example of a candidate for plenary that he got notes before I can think was. of. And the fact that it's... <laughs> The beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. It's kind of alluding to the fact that it's not necessarily talking about Jesus preaching as much as it is about 
Yeah, it seems it really, Mark 1, 1, 1 really seems like it's about Jesus. But then when you get to verse 14, he mentions the gospel. The next time he mentions the gospel, it seems like it's a message from God that is preached. And Jesus, at verse 15, what is Jesus doing? He's proclaiming the gospel of God, which is the kingdom of God is near. Repent and believe the gospel. So he's preaching the gospel. He's, I mean, Jesus is preaching it. He's proclaiming it, the gospel. So it's something he is definitely something Jesus proclaims in verse 14. Verse 1 sounds a lot like Jesus is the object. So, yeah, it really goes both ways. Uh, reference wouldn't work there? Reference absolutely would work. Okay. Uh, the, yeah, the good news, not just any good news, definitely not the good news about Caesar or anything like that. The word, the, the phrase good news was typically used of an announcement about a king coming in power. And so you would expect to be the good news of Caesar. Uh, and instead it's of Jesus Christ, which is unexpected, you know. So, so yeah, it could definitely be referenced. That works great. The plenary was. <laughs> yeah. Plenary. Can't go against the teachers. Yeah, well, right. <laughs> I, actually, actually, what I put in my notes was reference. Yeah. I put yeah, reference. It's, it's, um, it's but, I mean, I sure wouldn't argue against plenary. I just, it's real tough. It, it does the, and it says here that the plenary, requ is it required that the writer is intending a plenary? Yep. Yeah, it's, a, it's, it's, he has to intend it, which is why plenary is, you know, I, I'm, I almost yeah. never, it's, the pl plenary always feels to me like you're punting. You're just like, <laughs> that's why I said I'll go on. Yeah. And <laughs> yeah. say but because of the feel of verse one and the clear message of verse 14, so close together, I think there's a real strong chance that Mark is, Mark actually means it both ways. So, all right, Son of God, how about that one? Possessive. Possessive, yeah. Good. Nice to have a nice, easy possessive <laughs> once in a while. Isn't it? Um, could it be relationship to? If the word Son were missing, we would right. call it relationship. Oh, the of God. If it were Jesus Christ, the of God, we'd call it relationship because the Son is implied. But since the Son is there, we call it possessive. Is there ever a time where relationship would have that title in there? No, no. Time? It's always relationship is only when the word is missing. Yeah. And relationship is always obvious, I assume. Yeah, I think. I think so. Okay. Yeah. Mark one fourteen. After John was put in prison, he went to into Galilee, proclaiming the gospel of God. What's that one? Are we back to our favorite gospel, apposition? Yeah, yeah. Is it gospel, namely God? Or, oh, yeah, yeah, the gospel. God. I, I, I keep getting apposition reference. Oh, reference. Yeah, it's reference. Uh, not just any good news, but of God, specifically of God. Okay, it could be reference. It would be possessive. God's gospel? God's it could gospel. be. What else could it be? Well, I think source. you're right back to source. The subjective again. Yeah, I think source, uh, more specific than subjective, would be source. Okay. Uh, the gospel from God. Or would that be? That's the one I jotted down in my notes. The, the gospel, um, the good news that comes, we, we get it from God. That's kind of the feel I got of that verse. Just, I'm sorry, I was taking notes here. Reference. Source. Source. Yeah, source. I jotted two down. Source was one. Uh, reference is definitely possible, but there's one other one that I put down. Um, product. Yeah, it could be product. I guess product could be a little better than source. Huh? But the, the other one I put down was um, description. That's our very first one. Remember, description is when he doesn't want to be specific. He doesn't want to be any more specific than just saying the gospel associated with God. It's just the gospel and God are connected so many different ways. I'm not making any point here about how they're connected, just the gospel of, of God. And, and he just makes it. So that would be, if, if, if you took it that way, then that would be a generative of description. 
product wouldn't work actually. Production? Why wouldn't it work? Well, Produced I'm saying the product wouldn't work. Production right would. Produ yeah, production. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know. I, I, um, because product, it would be the gospel, which produces God. Yeah. Right. It would be God producing the gospel. Right. Which that would be production produced by. The gospel produced by God. D depending on how much we're to make of the common usage of kings, Caesar, and stuff being. I mean, there's an inscription about the gospel of Caesar that was really close in wording to this verse. I can't remember, is this verse or verse one, but one of them, it's, it's so closely, it's, it sounds like Mark is just almost making a play on that. And if so, then I would say it's, it's reference because he's switching out the object. It's the gospel of, no, not Caesar, God. I think you were saying that about one. About verse one? Yeah. Okay. All right. Okay, let's move on, verse 15. The time has come, he said. The kingdom of God is near. Possess it. God's kingdom. Okay. Anything else? I think that's right. God possess it. God's kingdom. Um, the only other thing I think of is maybe, again, description. Just a real general connection between king, the kingdom and God. Again, so many different ways that God and the kingdom are connected that he's not even being specific here. He's just kingdom of God. Um, could you look in here? Can you do association? Association. I, I think uh, association is usually a person associated with a party, not, not a thing associated with a person. Because if that otherwise, then that would just be um, description. Yeah. Questions on that one? Real quick, before you guys move on from the Mark one, yeah. If if you were to translate it as an apposition, you'd be saying that that the good news is God, right? Right. So yeah. So sometimes that's actually a pretty common thing nowadays for some preachers to say that. Uh, actually, doesn't Piper have a book title like yeah, that or something? Gospel is, God is the gospel. So, so that's the apposition. The gospel is God. Uh, after John was put into prison, Jesus went into Galilee proclaiming the gospel, namely God. That would be apposition. I don't think that's this is an appositional genitive. Um, not that I disagree with the theme of Piper's book, but I don't think... Um, this verse is stating that because, explicitly. I mean, like if that. you if you take a little bit of a theology of right there, I mean, he's talking about the kingdom of God, and if you, depending on how you interpret that kingdom of God, you view the you know God's kingdom as His rule and His reign over this earth. The good news then is, is literally God coming and ruling over. It's news about God and coming. coming to that. See, that's the reason I can't see this as an uh, apposition is because the gospel is news. God is a person. Yeah. Person isn't news. News isn't a person. It's news about a person. I see. And so, um, so apposition would would have to say the, the news itself is a deity, and it's not. I see. It comes from the deity. It's about the deity. It concerns the deity, but it isn't the deity. Okay. Makes sense. I see. Okay. Sorry. No, that's great. Great. Great question. Mark one four. Uh, we're still in Mark one. And so John came, baptizing in the desert region and preaching a baptism of repentance. Description? Description? Yeah. Uh, not specific, just generally associated with repentance. Okay. Anybody else? Reference. Okay, reference. Okay. Not just any baptism, but specifically of repentance. Okay, good. Anything else? What about means? Means. 
the the repentance is a tool to bring about the baptism? No, I don't think so. What's the one that has a more that causes the what about uh, product? The product. So the the baptism uh, produces baptism the produces the repentance. If I were going to go that direction, production. then instead of product, I think what I would say is um, telic. Oh, telic. Take a look at telic. Okay. That's telic means purpose. Uh, um, yeah. So the purpose of the baptism is to bring about repentance. Hmm. He's preaching a baptism. Now the word baptism is something he's preaching, right? So it's not talking about dunking in water. It's talking about a message about dunking in water. So he's preaching this message that has the purpose of bringing about repentance. I think that's I think that's it. Um, if we look at the word, if we think of baptism as the message, since he's, it's something he's preaching, then it has the purpose of bringing about repentance. So yeah, I, I, I the three that you mentioned are saying the three I jotted down: reference, description, and telic. Um, but I think I would land on telic because of that figure of speech, baptism being actually a message. The dunking in water doesn't have the purpose of bringing about repentance, right? But but you know that he's not talking just about the dunking. He's talking about the message about the dunking because it's, he's preaching it. He's preaching a baptism for the purpose of repentance. Because of the word preaching. As yeah, opposed to right, reforming right, or healing. Right, right, yep. Does that make sense, everybody? Well, then wouldn't association work with it then? The baptism association would be, repentance would be a party that someone's being associated with. So, no, it would, that's more, association is more of a person, okay. person's being associated with a group. You got that one? Anything else on that? Any more discussion? So are, are we, we are, repentance is modifying Baptism is not preaching. Exactly. Repentance is not, mo I'm not saying pre repentance is modifying the word preaching. It's mo modifying the word baptism. But what's the definition of baptism in this phrase here? What is the definition? Typically, the definition of baptism is you dunk into water. Here, the word baptism is a figure of speech referring not to an action, but to a message. So he preached, and then in put princes, instead of baptism, put a message of repentance, and that's how I'm taking it. And so repentance is modifying the baptism message that he was preaching. And the word message is implied, but by the word preaching. Does that make sense? Okay, great question. So why would it, why would it be for apposition? Apposition, the, the baptism Baptist. message, Baptist. namely, Repentance, because it's not re re repentance is something that the people were doing. It's repentance isn't a message; it's an action. Um, okay. So, so you got a message of an action. So it wouldn't it wouldn't be redefining it. It's close because I can see what you're thinking. You're thinking the message is about repentance. Yeah. A, a message. Um, namely repentance, but in your mind you're actually adding the word about repentance, which uh, would be, what would that be? If it's a message about repentance, what kind of genitive is that? I wouldn't call that apposition. I would call it <laughs> Don't bear throwing an extra credit on the fly. Okay, a message? If we had, if, if, pretend this just said he was preaching a message of repentance and we're, we're saying that's the topic of his message, how would you identify that? Reference. Yeah, reference. Message, not just any message, but specifically the one about repentance. So if you take it that way, it would be reference. How could you explain? Telic. Yeah, telic. Really make sense to me. Let's go back to telic. Genitive den denotes the purpose for which the word modified exists. Um, and the so it, um, he opened the he opened to the Gentiles an opportunity for faith. 
uh, that's the direction. Um, the you can see there's some grammars put put this as a subset of de destination. It's where it's going. It's what the, it's where it's going in a figurative way because it's the purpose of it. Um, this is for the purpose of your deliverance. He found no chance um, for repentance. Uh, the chance, the whole point of the chance was for repentance. So. So that it wouldn't tell it work. So, so tell it, and there, one where are we here now? Um, baptism, uh, baptism for the purpose, the message for the purpose of repentance. Yeah. Yeah. I, um, didn't we, the didn't we say? He thought was the strongest, wasn't it? Yeah, that's the one we, yeah, we, we okay. did say that would work. Yeah. Message for the purpose of repentance. So, um, so reference works. Um, and uh, I think description could potentially work, but I, I, I like telic on that one. All right, forgiveness of sins. I really do like descriptive for that one. Description? Yeah, I can't see the intelligent. Okay. All right. Anything else? Position, forgiveness, namely sins. <laughs> <No>. yeah. <laughs> that would mean the forgiveness and the sins are the same thing. Well, I can get five in there again on that. I think uh, concerning sins, reference concerning sins. forgiveness, not just any forgiveness, but specifically about sins. Regarding sin, regarding sin, with respect to sin. Mm, I think we're still missing one. It works a little better. Actually employed, so is that subjective or objective? Produced I see that either of those really fitting. Yeah. Why not? Why, why, why do you see now those aren't working? Subjective or objective? Well, forgiveness doesn't uh, produce, produce sins, and yeah. sins don't. Well, oh, it's subjective or objective. Okay, that's not necessarily producing or being perfect product. Yeah, those are subsets of it. So for, for objective and subjective, then the noun implies an action. And the genitive either receives that action or does that action. Okay. So what would be the action implied forgiveness. by the noun forgiveness? Um, to forgive? That's not a quick trick question. Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah. so forgiving is the action. Does the genitive cause that or receive that action? Do the sins do the forgiving, or do the sins get forgiven? Sins get forgiven, so that would be objective. Yeah, yeah, that's what I would. That's how I see this as an object of genitive. The sins get forgiven. Okay. Usually, you think of a person being forgiven, but you can also th th speak of sins being forgiven. Um, so. So yeah, I, I I put objective on that one. Even though, so, so you would, would you? Oh, I'm sorry. No, go ahead. Uh, so would you rule out descriptive? Uh, forgiveness of sins. Yeah, because I think I'm confident enough about the objective genitive that I, I I wouldn't say that he's just being general there. I think he's being more specific. The sins are getting forgiven. So that's the way I would see it. Yeah. So description is is more general. general yeah. Okay. Yeah. What were you saying, Andrew? The word forgiveness, though, there is not treated as a verb. No, so in the objective and subjective genitive, 
the noun, there's a noun being modified, but the noun implies some kind of an action. And that action either happens to the genitive or it's done by the genitive, subjective or objective. See, that's so, why I didn't really pick that because I don't see of sins or the sins really implying a... No, no. The, the word forgiveness implies an act. Okay. So you're going off... Okay. So the, the, yeah, it's the, it's the modified word that has to pr uh, imply the action. Imply the action. Yeah. Okay. And so the, the noun... Forgiveness is a noun. It's a thing. Forgiveness. Is, but, but it implies the action of forgiving. Something being forgiven. Yeah, and the sins are what get forgiven. They're receiving that action. Unless, and this is probably a huge stretch, but subordination. The what? Subordination. Oh, subordination. Forgiveness over sins? Yeah. Nah. So the sins are being forgiven. That's yeah, I wouldn't call it subordination because that's kind of a ruling idea. It's not, um, not... I don't see forgiveness as ruling over sin. It's eliminating the effect of the sin. So. Well, it would. The idea of forgiveness over sin, the sins defeated. Um, I guess the forgiveness, yeah. well. Yeah, I guess I, just, I don't see it. It seems like that pushes forgiveness in more of the direction of a proper noun. Like an entity or something, okay. yeah. As opposed to the right. idea of it moving more towards an action. Yeah. 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 Okay. Mark 2.14. Now we're into Mark 2. As he walked along, he saw Levi of the of Alpheus. Relationship. Very good. Because right. the word son is missing, right? So when you see son of Alpheus in your translation, they're taking this as a genitive of relationship because the word son is not there. All right. You shouldn't have said that so quick. You should have made people find it. <laughs> Mark two. <laughs> Mark two sixteen. Yeah, somebody would have thought it was that position. <laughs> uh, when this. So, so I'm pro well, okay. going to explain right. a little bit because I'm a little confused on, on the relationship. Okay. Um, so, if it would have said Esau Levi, the son of Alpheus, then that. Would not have been relationship. Uh, Correct. Possessive. Would have been possessive. Yeah. But because son is missing, mm -hmm. you probably would have, probably were not going to recognize it in your translation. That's right. You're, never, you're probably never going to need this um, just because it'll always, always be in the translation. So, but in case you notice it in the Greek, that's what it is. Yeah. And you have to make sure that the that Levi is male, so that you know it's the son of. So, uh, Alpha, yeah, Levi's a male, otherwise I'd be daughter of or something. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so uh, Mark 2.16, when the scribes of the Pharisees. Partitive? Partitive. Tell me why partitive. Uh, they're a sect of the Pharisees. Yep. So they're a subset. They're a sect of the Pharisees. So the Pharisees are a big group, and the scribes are a subset. All the, all the sects of the first century had their various scribes. The Pharisees had their scribes, and so these are the ones that belong to the Pharisees. So yeah, so you get the Pharisees as a big group, and scribes are a part of that, so it's part of them. Well, reference. Uh, reference. The scribes, not just any scribes, but the ones of the Pharisees. Yeah, it could be. That's the, the same idea. And one other one it could be, since it's talking about people. Association. Association, yeah. The scribes associated with the Pharisees, the sect of they're associated with that group. So, yeah. So next Probably. time you have this class, you need to make these lines longer. <laughs> so you can write stuff in there. <laughs> or multiple lines. Yeah. yeah. Give us an idea of how many. Different oh, yeah. We get five different ones and I got a little space there. <laughs> yeah. Well, I did say bring your laptop. Thanks. <laughs> All right, so, uh, so when the scribes of the Pharisees saw that he was eating with, now we've got a preposition, meta, with the sinners and tax collectors. So sinners and tax collectors, I'd identify them the same way. What kind of a genitive would those be? 
Well, are we supposed to be looking at the preposition? More? Well, yeah, the best thing to do would be look up meta, but we're going to try to go ahead and just identify the genitive without looking up meta. Just for practice purposes. So association uses with. Yes, it's yep. not absolute. I'd say association. association. Meeting with. That was the whole point of the verse, right? Is right. he's associating with these people. So that one was kind of an easy one since that's what they get mad about. Some people would take this as a apposition. He's apposition. <laughs> well, to, um, to, to maybe um, give them reasoning to go to the bar yeah, or whatever. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. Okay. Um, what is theology? Yeah. Yeah. So they said to the disciples of him. Possessive. Possessive. All right. And... Uh, why is he eating? I don't know why I have two lines there, but why is he eating and drinking w with Meta again, tax collectors and sinners? Association. 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 Yep, same one. Mm -hmm. On hearing this, Jesus said to them, it is not the healthy who have need of a doctor. So I'm just going to keep saying absolute would be the absolute. <laughs> Since you said it's it's in the examples. No, it's not absolute. Absolute would be, objective? be a, the subject of the... What did you say? Subject? Object, uh, objective. Objective? Yeah. So the, the word need implies uh, the action of needing something, and yes. the doctor is, gets needed. Yeah, I need a doctor. Yeah. Okay. Okay. <laughs> you need a doctor, though. <laughs> you will need a doctor. Uh, what else? Need, need. I guess I got thrown a little bit. I I wasn't thinking of need as being a a noun in my mind. Yeah, it's a noun. So they have so. The English, some English translations tr translate it as a verb. They need a doctor. That's a verb. But in the Greek, it's a noun. They have need of a doctor. Yeah. So, but it, it also conveys that action. Yeah, it implies an action. Yeah. Any, any other possibilities? Didn't like it, but reference again with that. Yeah. Well, no, don't, don't, uh, don't be hard on yourself there. I, I, <laughs> I like your reference. That's what I put down as reference because it's, I think this is just a, a good example of re, a generative reference. They have need. Need is just way too broad. That doesn't tell you hardly anything. You could need a bazillion different things, and so he specify. He narrows it down of a doctor. It's not the healthy who have a need of a doctor and then it, it narrows it all the way down to one thing. So yeah, I think that's a real good example of genitive of reference. Well see now I'm kind of confused because I see it as the same way as Mark 1 4 where it says the forgiveness of sins. Forgiveness we think is a verb, but it's it's a noun. Uh-huh. And it denotes the action of forgiving. Right. So yeah. we, we said that was objective. No, didn't we say that was telic? No, that was the the baptism one was telic. Oh, that was the baptism. But yeah, um, objective. Yeah, yeah. Uh, this is. Um, I don't have a problem with seeing this as an objective genitive. Um, the doctor gets needed. Um, I think it's. I mean, the meaning is exact. Is there the doctor gets needed and. It's not just any need, but specifically of a doctor. Um, so why do I think like reference more here and objective more on the other one? Um, and this is, you're saying you like this for reference because we've got the genitive restricts the reference application of the word right. modified to one certain thing. One certain thing. So not, yeah, so, not needing... Multitude, they need doctor. Yeah, it's not that they need bread or they need money or they need any, they need doctor, need a doctor. 
Um, yeah, I just I just see the implied action in in the word forgiveness more than I see the implied action in the word need. It's hard for me to explain why. But I guess I, I don't think I, I wouldn't I wouldn't say you're wrong. It's just, it's just the way I see it. No. All right, Hebrews one two. In these last days. <laughs> It's a tricky uh, one. Lim 22, time. Oh, very good. Ten extra credit points. We're using one that we learned today, and we haven't talked about it in an hour. Very good. Time. 20 extra credit points. <laughs> oh, my. Yeah. Quiet, written down. <laughs> Jerry fired it off. <laughs> Stole my thunder. I think Jerry was kind of sitting just waiting. Wait, wait. He's like, just go to the next one. Just go to the next one. <laughs> <laughs> it's time for me to go. <laughs> yeah, before you lose points. <laughs> what, what, what time is it? Yeah, what happened? Time. There you go. <laughs> because right now the grades are um, everyone's got a like zero except Josiah's got 10, EJ's got 20. So. <laughs> That's the only way to get points in this one. Wow. <laughs> okay, so yeah, time. Very good. In these last days, uh, has spoken to us in his son, whom he appointed heir of all things. Subordination. Subordination. Very good. Man, 30 extra credit points. Oh, oh, oh. I knew I should have gone. <laughs> because subordination is such a fun genitive. Very good. Yeah, subordination. Heir over all things. Yeah. yeah. Good, good, good. All right. Through, there's Dia, there's a preposition. Whom so the word whom is a genitive. Um, I should quit while I'm ahead. Yeah. I'll go with cause. Cause, okay. Um, can we refine it a little more since it's yeah. it's a person? It's a whom and not a what? Agent. That's what I'm saying. You're thinking of agent. Yeah. All right. That was an extra credit points for that. <laughs> Since you're thinking of agent. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Now we know why his teachers. <laughs> I would call that I would call that agent. Uh, through whom he also made the world. Okay. Ephesians two eighteen. For through him. Any wild guesses on that? Can you just real quick look at that that one right here too? So. Okay, so the whom is modifying son. Um. That that is modifying son from. Through. Um. Actually, it's. I think it's modifying made. Wait, genitives. Typically modified now. <laughs> yeah, but but every once in a while you got something like this. So he made the world through him. It's not cause, is it? Well, since it's personal, I would say agent. Agent. Oh. He made the universe through him. And so it's... Uh, I'm looking at Ephesians 2.18. Yeah, you would expect this to be a dative. If you make something through someone, it's modifying the make, and it's a, you'd expect this to be a dative, and typically Dia would take a dative, but here it's a, it's a genitive, so it's, um, it's a little bit unusual. It just seems like it should be a dative, though. Let me just double-check. Hebrews, Hebrews 1.2. I wonder if I didn't make a mistake. Um, let's see, where's Dia? Here it is. Through whom? It's a genitive. So it's taken, uh, Dia takes a genitive. Hmm. Who knew? Okay, so. <laughs> so, so, <laughs> so, yeah, just a, um, if you if we look at the definition of the dia over here, this preposition, with the genitive, 
or with the accusative. It doesn't even take a dative. It only takes a genitive or accusative. So um, and that's, the, that's what it would do in every case? Yeah, it'd either take a genitive or an accusative. Uh, or an accusative. And that's a preposition? Yeah. So down here, I'm going to through. I always think of prepositions that take a genitive like ek or apa or something. I, I would have thought dia through by means of it would be more of a dative idea. But here it seems like um, it's definitely a genitive. And it, through whom also he made the universe. It's, 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 it's definitely modifying he made. It's modifying a verb. So it's just an unusual genitive. So um, the the whom he appointed. So the whom that's above there, next to son, that's not that's not a genitive up there. Whom he appointed, heir of all things. This one here. Yeah. No, because it whom the dia before it. Son, let's see. Because you've got whom he made. Right. So and you got whom he appointed upon last days. Through uh, uh, these last days, he spoke to us in his son, whom, that's an accusative. Yeah, it's a, he, it's a direct object of placed or appointed, he appointed him. So it's an accusative, direct object. Yeah, good so eye. is my statement actually right? Because it doesn't have the dia before the whom, that's why it's not. No, because not. dia can take an accusative. Okay. Yeah. Just can't take a dative, which I, which I thought it would. Well, speaking of uh, dia taking genitives, yes. Ephesians 2.18. <laughs> Or through I him. This is a trick question, but since I have so many extra points, I can afford <laughs> to lose a couple. <laughs> agent? Uh, oh, you're already uh, doing Ephesians 2.18? Yeah, through him? That's agent. That's what yep. we went to. Yeah. Okay. We have access through him. Agent. Yep. Um, since it was the same as the other one. Well, I know. That's why I thought it was a trick question. No, no, not a trick question. Can't be that obvious. I gave it away when I said, speaking of genitives following Dia. All right. So for through him, we both have access. We have access. It's another unusual genitive, right? Because what is it modifying? Have. have, yeah, which is not a noun, it's a verb. We cover this? I'm pretty sure we covered it. Guessing it's not part of it then. No, not part of it. And what part of speech is that? Just looking at it in English, we have access. It's acting like the direct object. We're direct object twenty-three. 23 yeah. It's exactly what it is. Direct object. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Ten thousand extra points. Whoa! <laughs> <laughs> right. Okay, so we both have access, direct object, to the Father by one Spirit. Consequently, you are you are no longer foreigners or aliens, but fellow citizens. Of the saints. Yeah, that's absolutely. That's kind of no, yeah, that's okay. that would be subject. That's not subject, yeah. So, yeah. Association. Yeah, association. Mm -hmm. They're associating with the. I mean, they're associated with that group of the saints, citizens of the saints. Uh, part of it is the same kind of idea, right? The saints are the big group and they're citizens within that group. Yeah. Okay. And members of the household? Yes, the same thing. Yeah, same thing there. I, I guess I lean a little bit more towards part of it. Just because household... Doesn't seem like a group as much. It seems like 
Yeah, I, I, I guess I would call that one part of household is the big category and members are pieces of it. That makes sense? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Of God? Possessive. Possessive. <sighs> nice, relaxing, possessive. <laughs> Verse 20. Built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets. Do they do apostles, chi, prophets there? Or, I mean, how do you get those two in one genitive? Or, um, yeah, I think there's a chi, Ephesians 2.18. So both of those apostles and prophets would have the genitive. Yeah, they're genitive. both in the genitive case. So, okay. uh, oops, that's the wrong verse. Foundation of the, there it is. Apostles, so the apostles, that's genitive. Chi, yep. prophets, that's genitive. Okay. Thanks. And Chi is and? And, yeah. That's yeah, absolute. It's, it's, Source. So the the source of the foundation is the apostles and prophets. Okay. Built on the foundation that came from the apostles and prophets. Is that production? Production would be the foundation producing the apostles and or the, the product, product would be products, yeah. apostles and prophets produce the foundation. I like that. Yeah. Okay. Anything else? Well, so far, I don't like it theologically because I don't think the foundation was produced by them. But yeah, maybe it's true. true. Maybe it was. I don't know. Well, except they did the get the teaching. Mm -hmm. I'm sure. They started the church, I guess. You could go that way. Yeah. So, what do you think? That, what is the foundation? Gospel. Apostolic message. The message, the gospel, the New Testament. We can't have Christ as the foundation because if you keep reading, he ends up being the cornerstone of the foundation. God's foundation. They're teaching. You're saying their teaching is the foundation? Okay. All right. So if we go with that. Yeah, then that's fine. Okay. Then, uh, then, then we like, we like product. Uh, we like anything else? The Apostles and Prophets Foundation belongs to them. Message belongs to them. It works. That's probably not what's emphasized by Paul in this verse, though. Cause? Cause. Okay, I think um, foundation caused by... They made it happen. That's too close to source, and we didn't like that as much as product, right? Yeah, I think they're all three okay. the same, pointing to the same thing, and product is the most, the more Better. best fit. So, Better yeah. Fit. So, are you, are you doing product or production? Um, because I thought production is produced by, and product would be. Production, which the genitive produces, yeah, so it'd be, it would be production. Okay. Yeah. What else? Okay, you're killing me. I want, what, are your, what are your thoughts? You want, okay, my, I'm, I'm, I'm just giving you a chance because this is one, this is one of your favorites. I put apposition. 
And I'll tell you why. Because I think apostles and prophets are put there as a figure of speech for their message. The foundation is the apostles and prophets. They're the foundation. So I think what he's saying is the built on the foundation, namely the apostles and prophets. What do you mean by that? Namely, their, their message. Uh, so, um, so I see that as I, – I, and the reason I see that is because Christ is a stone in the next phrase. And so the apostles and prophets are the rest of the stones. He's the cornerstone, and they're the rest of the stones. No, they're the foundation. Yeah. In the foundation, right. The, uh, we're talking about the, the – yeah, within the foundation. Saints and members of the household are the rest of the stones. Yeah. But I'm talking about the stones of the foundation, not the stones yeah. of the building. Okay. Yeah. Well, the stones of the foundation. You've got that cornerstone that starts right. it, and you can call it block. Which is why I don't think of it as source or a subjective idea. At first I thought subjective genitive, foundation laid by the, found, the apostles and prophets. I thought, oh, it's subjective. They laid the foundation. But, but then I thought, no, because, because in the, the whole figure here, Christ is a rock in the corner. What are all the other rocks in this foundation? They're the apostles and prophets. Now the figure of speech is still, it's talking about their message, not the persons. It's, it is their message. But, um, yeah, I think apposition built on them and Jesus. All right, so now I'm going to throw out a weird question. Like, all right, so what is the importance? Yeah, I know, sorry. <laughs> but what is the importance of, like, I mean, because I'd be like, okay, well, since I, I don't know which one it's going to be, if there's three, three positions, they're really – does it matter whether this is source or – okay, so either our interpretation is going to be the church was built on something that came from the apostles and prophets, or the church was built on the apostles and prophets. I guess the reason I like the latter is because otherwise we're not defining um, the foundation – the foundation is obviously not a literal foundation, right? It's something. It's referring to something else. Well, what else? If we define it as source, it's just we still haven't defined it. We're just saying whatever it is, it came from them. Um, it seems like it holds the picture as you carry it on to Christ. Right. Better. Yeah, that's the biggest reason. It's just the word picture all fits together. With he's just this word picture, apostles and prophets, Christ anchoring them. Now, what does that mean? Oh, it's their message. It's the gospel. So the so the overall meaning comes out the same. But there's value in word pictures. You know, picturing it in your mind. That's why he gives you a word picture instead of just stating it literally. So, okay. Only issue there is that Christ. We act. I can see where we can actually be on Christ in a more um, tangible way of being on the apostles and the prophets. I, I don't yeah. think of them. I, I see them only as valuable in their distribution of the message, whereas being on Christ has a lot more implication. Yeah. In connection and picture. In picture to the way the way this verse comes out to me, he's really, really elevating the apostles and prophets almost to an uncomfortable level. Right the way he's associating them with Christ, but he's still putting Christ above them by saying cornerstone, chief cornerstone. Um, but I think he is trying to elevate them to a really high level. Uh, so you kept saying in there the message of them that I, the, the, like, I understand that, but like, if you take that, then, then you have to say that, okay, so built on the foundation of the message of the apostles and prophets, then you apply that, to the, what he's comparing, you know, Christ Jesus himself and his message being the chief cornerstone. No, I, th I don't think we. I don't think we're tied into that. It's a great, great observation, but I, th I think we can let Paul expand out his metaphor. As soon as he starts talking about Jesus, we can let him. It, he every, any metaphor just expands out as soon as Jesus is in there, because because we know with all Paul's theology, right? Okay. So um, Christ, and I think the word himself. He didn't have to use the word himself. He could just say Christ, and but he's saying him, him, the person, 
Yeah. As opposed to this other one where we were talking about a meta, you know, kind of a metaphor of their message. Now we're talking about the person himself. And then I see, and then even going back to this, this, I mean, it's personal there. He's talking about people. You're no longer foreigners or aliens. You're citizens of the saints. You're part of a household. Mm -hmm. I guess it's people. And the foundation is the apostles and the prophets, not, not their teaching necessarily, but the people themselves yeah. in that case. I don't know if that makes sense. Really. Okay, but in what sense would they be foundation that, that upon which the house of God is built? It, I mean, you could say, I could see you saying their ministry, not just their teaching, but a little bit broader, their ministry. Uh, but it has to be something there, some something that can be built upon. Because so, Paul counters that in his Corinthian passage, who are we but just distributors right. of a message, some water, some plant. Right. Christ is the one. So he'll keep us from getting too carried away with yeah, this by saying, hey, we're, yeah, we're just nothing. Yeah. 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 Okay. Um, we run out of time? Oh, we've got an hour and a half, haven't we? Okay. Well, uh, we can finish the verse at least. Christ himself, that's only that's one more generative in the verse. Himself being the chief cornerstone. You know, it's like an agent to me. Being is the verb that it's, I assume it's. Well, himself is modifying Christ Jesus. Um, it's not a passive verb, though, so. Let's see, what are we here? Ephesians 2 20? It's the other way around. Mm. Okay. So I don't lose points. I take that back. <laughs> Christ Jesus himself. Let's just take the whole thing as a genitive. They're all in a genitive case. So let's um, underline this whole phrase Christ Jesus himself is the genitive. What is Christ Jesus himself modifying? Foundation, right? Foundation. Cornerstone. No, built on the foundation of Apostle Christ. Because Jesus himself being the cornerstone. Yeah, so it's two cornerstone. No, I don't think it's modifying so, cornerstone. Well, it's, I thought it was being myself. It's not modifying being. Well said. Okay, it's the nominative. Oh. Right. Subject. Of the there you go. <laughs> there you go. It was it. Finally, you got the absolute. It's the subject of this, that clause, isn't it? Jesus is the cornerstone. Being is just a form of is. Oh, and there's a genitive called... So it, it, it's the genitive of absolute. It's oh. Absolute yeah, genitive. one of our ones today? Yeah, it was one from today. Oh, Jerry. It's the, one that, so it's the one Jerry's been guessing every single time. Yeah. <laughs> I was just waiting for him to say it. It's going to land. It's going to land. Absolutely. <laughs> Yeah, so this is sub. It's just the sub. It's like you, you. It should be in the nominative, right? It should be nominative. Jesus is the cornerstone. It's the subject of that phrase, but it's a genitive, so it's a um, genitive absolute. And and why why would it be a genitive? Why wouldn't Paul go ahead and use the normal grammar and use a nominative there? Anytime they do something different than the norm, it's it's usually for emphasis. So he's wow. emphasizing Christ, Jesus Himself. I'm going to put this in the genitive so it catches your attention. So not it's not necessarily a genitive because it's trying to tie back into the preceding. Right. Yeah, it's not modifying anything. It's just but standing. That's why I say it. absolute. It's just standing there. But he purposely pinned a genitive as opposed to a nominative. A nominative. Yeah. Just yeah. for emphasis. Yeah, just not a really for connection to any Exactly. Other. Exactly. Yep. yep. Hmm. Great great work everybody. Fantastic. All right. So your final exam is the rest of these. Especially that Romans 2. Uh, if you get uh, if you get those right, that's yeah, one million extra credit points. So um, <laughs> feel free to contact me if you have any questions on any of these or any time in the future. Uh, I would love to just talk to you about this or Datives, for that matter, I've given you the whole grammar. That first document that I emailed you it has the whole grammar with the datives and all that. And you can look, you can just go down through those datives and read the definitions, and you'll see a lot of them are real similar. 
you'll get you'll get a feel for them real fast, especially when you look at the um, examples. And then um, my advice to you, if you want to go further in Greek, um, practice the genitives. Look up the prepositions when you come across. Take that, go through the class that's on online uh, the, on the Food for Soul. Uh, go through the, the prepositions class. That'll give you a feel for prepositions. Um, next most valuable thing is a tie between datives and participles. Participles are a blast. And if you want something that's going to be the most helpful in interpreting verses, participles. When you have a participle that comes before the having done this, he did that. Um, when you see that kind of thing, that's one of those ones that you've been looking for where it's real, real specific. It has to mean this action happened first and then this action. It's not clear in the English all the time, very clear in the Greek. So participles are difficult, but they're a great, great. Maybe we can do a class on participles. Um, so uh, that would be my advice if you want to keep